friends. Welcome to the Greenfield Hill Congregational Church. Happy Sunday. Welcome. Day by day, God leads us to the deep pools of peace, to the wells of grace. Day by day, Jesus calls us to pour ourselves out in service, to anoint the stranger with hope. Day by day, the Holy Spirit shows us the community we can be, the family we are called to become. Welcome to this place of grace and peace and community. Our first hymn, which will be led by our wonderful soloists, is How Great Thou Art. You can follow along by pulling up our bulletin on your phone or on your computer. You just go to our church website, greenfieldhillchurch.com, and look for GHCC online. Let's sing and worship together. Again, welcome, welcome to this beautiful old sanctuary on the hill on this lovely fall weekend. We are so glad to have you with us in worship, and we are offering lots of different ways to worship this weekend, together online, as we're doing right now, but also together in person in this sanctuary. Last Sunday was the first time that we were back together in church and we were overjoyed to see all the faces in the pews. And we also had lots of people listening in from outside on the lawn, which we also welcome. So whether you're inside or outside or online, we are together, one body of Christ in the spirit of God's love. Welcome. We are excited to be having a couple in-person fellowship events coming up in this month. On Sunday afternoon, the 18th, that's next Sunday afternoon, from 4 to 6, our fellowship board is offering a family-friendly Oktoberfest. They've got the super-duper weenie truck coming to the church grounds, and families are invited to come and enjoy the food and spread out and picnic and just delight in seeing one another. Of course, we do need you to let us know if you're coming for that, and uh, we hope you are. 
And the following weekend, that's October 25th, we want to make sure that our kids have some Halloween fun this year. So on that Sunday, before Halloween, we are inviting kids and their parents here to the church at 4 o'clock for an hour of games and some safe trick-or-treating and, of course, a costume parade. So again, let us know you're coming, and we hope you are. If you have kids anywhere from fourth grade right up through 12th grade, we've got a youth group for you or a confirmation class. All of those are meeting and having a great fun together. So please just be in touch with me and uh, let me know how we can serve your family. We love seeing your kids. And of course, for adults, our Bible studies on Thursday mornings can uh, continue 10 a.m. on Thursdays right here at the church, either outside, weather permitting, or here in the sanctuary. The scriptures that they're focusing on with David this fall are resurrection scriptures. The liveliness of this church never ceases, and that's why we love it so much. All right, so now time for our children's message. I've got a little video to share that I put together with some friends this week, and it's all about these things. So, here we go, enjoy. So every day when I go out of the house, I put on a mask. Of course I do. I know you do too. It's important for us to put on masks. I've got lots of different masks. Maybe you do too. I've got this pretty one with a rose on it. Then there's this one, also really pretty with blue pattern. I like this one, it's got stripes on it. That's kind of fun. And then sometimes I just wear very ordinary plain white mask. And then lots of times I wear just the basic mask that a lot of people wear, like this one. And I feel very safe. But there is something kind of tricky about wearing masks and maybe you've noticed this too. It is really hard to recognize people when they're wearing masks. Sometimes you're not really sure who's standing right in front of you. I asked some of my friends to show you what I mean. So my friend Sarah and Lila and Jane and Sarah, two Sarahs, they knew exactly what I meant and they're gonna show you right now. Oh, hey, it's, it's Kathleen. No, it's Sarah and you're Sarah. <laughs> Janelle. No, it's Jane. <laughs> no. Emily. No, it's Sarah! No! No! Uh, is Who are you? Is, are you? Are you Fred? No, I'm Lila. Oh! <laughs> Christian! Long time no see! So close, it's Sarah. We've done this before, haven't we? Yes, we have. <laughs> Those girls really made me laugh. It can be pretty funny when you're not sure who's behind that mask. And all of this made me think of a passage in the Bible that I really love. It's not about masks exactly. It's about God and how much God loves us. It's from the Psalms, which is just a fancy way of saying song. And it's Psalm number 139. And it says, God, you know me like nobody else. You know everything about me. You know the real me. You know what I'm thinking. You know what I'm feeling, and that's pretty wonderful. But what that song is saying is that there's no kind of mask that is ever going to come between you and God. You never have to worry about whether God is going to recognize you. God knows you completely, knows what you're feeling, and loves you completely. Even when sometimes it feels like other people don't understand you very much, God is the one who completely understands everything you're thinking and feeling and loves you and always loves you. You never have to worry about whether God's going to recognize you, even if you're wearing one of these. And that is pretty wonderful. Our scripture for today, we're calling a Ten Commandments conversation that David and I will share in together. In today's sermon, David will be looking at several of the Ten Commandments as a, a useful guide to any election. The Ten Commandments were given by God to Moses just at the point when the Jewish people were trying to figure out how to be a nation together. So here are some of those commandments, each of them followed by a little 
tongue-in-cheek commentary, imagining someone hearing them for the very first time. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Thou shalt have no other God. Thou shalt not make any graven image of me, or you're in big trouble. Nothing? No big statue, no little painting? I mean, it will be nice, uh, tasteful. Uh, wait, wait till you see Michelangelo or Caravaggio. Oh, and the Sistine Chapel. You'll love it. Nope, nothing. No thing. And thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. But gall dang it sounds so silly. The way you use God's name doesn't sound silly. Go ahead, think of the last three times you used God's name. Not in prayer. Proud of that? Don't waste my name. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Can we move Sabbath to Tuesday? There's just so much to do on Sunday. I don't have time for... Really? Really? You don't want to finish that sentence, do you? You haven't got time for me? God? Honor your mother and father. Agreed. That doesn't mean obey, right? Just honor, be nice to, take care of. Agreed. Thank you. Thou shalt not kill. Ah, uh, well, except for... Mm, don't kill hopes, don't kill spirit, don't kill opportunities, don't kill joy, don't kill people. Thou shalt not steal. What about everybody else? Crooks and thieves and fraudsters and scam artists? I tell them the same thing, and I'm telling you, don't be one of them. Thou shalt not lie. Not even a little lie? A white lie? Even to make someone feel better? Don't kid yourself. A lie only makes you feel better, for a minute. Thou shalt not covet anything. But there's stuff I want. Heck, there's stuff I need. I mean it. Then work harder, or more, or save, or be patient, or grow up. But don't lust after, don't drool over, don't covet. Someday you'll thank me. I've been preaching since Nixon was running for president. So that's, I think, 13 presidential elections that I've had to wade through. And in the old days, you had to watch what you preach for two or three weeks before the election, that's all. Now you have to watch what you preach for three or four years before an election. Don't get political, people have said to me, for 50 years. And then everybody watches carefully for body language and coded words. If, if I pick up my hymn book with my right hand, well, then you know who to vote for. But if I take a drink of water with my left hand, oh, I always knew he was like that. Well, let's have a little pre-election sermon fun, if anything about this election can be fun. We're going to use the Ten Commandments as a guide to the election. And you probably think that I'm going to focus on commandment number six in the hopes that neither candidate will kill the other. But I'm aiming for something a little broader in terms of perspective than that. The Ten Commandments came about as God's guide to being a civilized society. The Jewish people did not begin as a nation. Starting with Abraham, they were uh, a wandering tribe and then an enslaved people in Egypt until Moses led them to freedom. And on the way to the promised land, to what would become Israel, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And those commandments fall into two categories, how to get along with God and how to get along with people. Israel was about to become a nation. They were establishing a society. They would be choosing leaders. And so with the Ten Commandments, God was giving some ground rules. First, for priorities, and second, for civic life. And most of them, if we stretch our imagination a little bit, most of them are good advice anytime we're about to pick a leader. 
The first bunch have to do with God. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me, says God. Number two, you shall not make any graven image. Don't make God into an idol. Number three, you shall not take the name of God in vain. And number four, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. You may remember the comedian Chevy Chase when he was on Saturday Night Live. He'd come out on the stage and he'd say, I'm Chevy Chase and you're not. These first four commandments are God's version of, I'm God and you're not. Don't make me into something. Don't shape me into something. Don't try to limit me. God is saying, I am always more than you can imagine. I'm God and you're not. And he goes on to say, you're going to show your understanding of that by not turning me into a piece of wood or stone, by not tossing my name around like some lucky rabbit's foot, and by reserving one day a week, a Sabbath day, as a day just for us, God says. You know how married couples have learned to schedule a date night as a, as a way to keep their spark alive. Not something random, but, but something that's planned and scheduled. It's a way of saying to the other person, you're important to me. And that's God's idea with the Sabbath. Let's have a planned, scheduled date each week, God says, in order to keep our spark alive. I grew up in a house and a family and at a time when this stuff was taken seriously. The Sabbath, Sunday, was for God. Church, Sunday school, family time, quiet time. I didn't buy a Sunday newspaper until I was an adult and I couldn't play Sunday sports for the longest time. And oh my, we could not take God's name in vain in no way. That was a biggie. God's name is holy. It's not to be tossed about, exploited, used as a vulgarity, or turned into a curse. Now, of course, we kids, we tried to make variations of God's name that we thought we could get away with. Some were silly, like saying, Jesus Christ, peanut butter. Putting God's name in it made it sound adult and emphatic, but the peanut butter, we hoped, would get us off the hook with God and with our parents. Some of the things we came up with were meant to approximate the real thing, like gosh darn it, instead of, well, you know, or geez, or the seemingly harmless gee whiz. But they were stand-ins for Jesus. We all knew it. We all knew what we were trying to get away with. And so in my home, no geez and no gee whiz. When I went off to prep school, our, our lunches and our dinners were formal affairs, and each meal, each meal began with a student-led prayer. Now, most formal prayers, even prayers in church, end with, for Christ's sake, amen. And it's usually said with an air of respect. But we teenagers, we would compete with one another to get as close to a curse as possible. So for Christ's sake, amen, would soon become for Christ's sake. And then adding a, a tone and an attitude, for Christ's sake, trying so earnestly to break one of the Ten Commandments, a lesser one, we thought, and yet have plausible deniability. But these four commandments have a single purpose that is really useful when we come close to an election day. Don't let anybody else or anyone else think that they're God or act like God or be treated like God. Nothing and no one is a stand-in for God. Our human pre-election application of this can be don't put anybody on a pedestal. Don't make anyone an idol. We people, we, we human people are always in a rush to make someone into a hero, to elevate them. Everyone is the next great superstar at whatever they're doing, up on a pedestal. People even mimic bowing down to their favorite idol, whether it's a sports idol or anybody else, only to discover later on that their hero wasn't so heroic and their idol was made of clay. Remember O.J. Simpson? 
one of the greatest college and professional football players of all time, until he may or may not have murdered his wife, followed by a bizarre escape and a bizarre trial and, and a bizarre life. And fans, especially football fans, but fans in general all across America, had to start to rethink the word hero that they had applied to O.J. Simpson for so many years. Does carrying a football well make you a hero? What puts a person on a pedestal? Who should we bow down to? The four commandments are God's reminder. Humans are human. Don't worship them. Don't idolize them. Well, let's look at thou shalt not bear false witness, which usually gets simplified as don't lie. Although that may miss the point, biblical scholars tell us that the commandment really is more about lying in an official capacity. Society can't function. Our legal structures can't work if people can lie willy-nilly. And that's why we make people swear an oath in court. And that's why we have perjury laws. If your word means nothing, then our societal relationships and our interactions in the community fall apart. Can you, this is the challenge, can you get up in the morning and tell the truth all day long? My father was my pastor growing up, and I heard him preaching, I'm sure, a thousand times, but one of his sermons has always stood out. It was called The White Lie. At his point, and he lived by it, his point was there is no such thing as a white lie. Every lie is a glimpse into a person's character. God is telling Israel, hey, you want your country to work? You want your businesses to prosper? You want your neighborhood to be good? Then tell the doggone truth, or else no one's going to trust you about anything. Let's tackle thou shalt not kill. I guess once America decided not to let Aaron Burr be president, we haven't had a real killer in the White House. Although, come to think of it, Teddy Roosevelt perhaps killed a few in his Rough Rider days down in Cuba. Ah, but there's the rub. That was war in battle, wasn't it? Mano a mano. Uh, maybe that doesn't count. As you can imagine, every Bible scholar, every church preacher, every religious professional has turned all of the Ten Commandments inside and out, looking for exceptions and nuances, like with the thou shalt not bear false witness. Maybe that's not about lying to save face or to get out of a jam. Maybe we, it only means to lie officially? I don't buy that either. And with thou shalt not kill, plenty of folks all across the Christian spectrum have said that, well, it really means thou shalt not murder. But self-defense is okay, war is okay, collateral damage is okay, executions are okay, accidents are okay. That gets to be a lot of okays. Why not? take God at God's word. Don't kill. That's God's preference, God's standard, God's hope. The world would be better if nobody killed. And of course, we all can imagine necessary killings, just wars, self-defense, stopping a violent crime in action. But God, being God, is allowed to state God's preference. Don't kill. When we elect presidents and Congress people, we are electing those who will decide, especially about war, big wars, little wars, skirmishes, people get killed. We often talk about electing a person who will have his finger on the nuclear button, the only person who can start a nuclear war. More likely, we're electing a person who orders our men and women into battle and it's their finger who's on the triggers and the buttons, their lives that will be forever changed by killing or being killed. Every president in my lifetime has called that the most daunting responsibility, to send our young people in harm's way. We look for people who are wise and judicious, people of patience and strength, of faith and action to bear that daunting responsibility. 
The last commandment may be the most interesting of all. Thou shalt not covet. And it goes on to list everything from your neighbor's spouse to your neighbor's things. And I define covet by the amount of drool that's hanging from your lips as you consider something that you want really bad. To covet something is to want something so bad that you'll do anything, anything, anything to get it. Say anything. Hurt anyone. My guess is that coveting is at the root of half of the commandments we've looked at today. Killing, stealing, adultery, lying. Why does any of that happen? You want something so bad that maybe you'll lie for it. Maybe you'll cheat for it. Maybe you'll kill for it. You want it and you won't let anything stop you. Ethics, morality, truth, reality. Out the window. All that matters is that you get what you want and nothing and nobody will stand in the way. Let's admit it. We all have something that we want and we can't get. Maybe not now, maybe not ever. Me, an apartment in Prague or in Greenwich Village. I've always wanted to be married to Lauren Bacall my whole life, but our marriages kept us apart. You see, most of us have breaks on our wants. Uh, we call it ethics, we call it morals. God's Ten Commandments are a first universal attempt at breaks. Don't put anything above God. Don't want something so bad you'll do anything. Don't fudge the truth. Don't treat life cheaply. We often talk about American government as a system of checks and balances. Uh, that way no one part of government can get out of control. And that's the idea behind these 3,000 year old commandments. They're God's checks and balances keeping us in check and well balanced in our personal life and our national life. The example that I always use whenever I'm teaching the Ten Commandments in Bible study is thou shalt not steal. Imagine how your life would be different if you never had to worry about stealing. Not your car, not your house, not your wallet, not your identity. Nobody trying to hack into your accounts, no surveillance cameras everywhere, no locked doors, no theft insurance, no worrying about strangers in the neighborhood. Our world, our daily life would be transformed if we simply obeyed one of those Ten Commandments. That's what God was up to with the Ten Commandments. It wasn't to take our fun away. It was a way to say, you want a great country? You want a great life? You want less stress? You want more joy? You want a good leader, a good nation, a good town? Get your priorities right with God, with people. Last week, I was up in the Berkshires writing, and I visited my friend who's a docent at the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge where I was staying. Rockwell is famous for capturing the American spirit and the American ideal, and perhaps no more clearly than his famous Four Freedoms paintings. They were based on a speech by President Franklin Roosevelt. Like the Ten Commandments, the Four Freedoms get to the heart of a good country. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear. The leaders we choose have the privilege of representing the best of us, the best of our principles, the best of our practices. Our privilege as citizens is to lead them, to inspire them by our best. Amen. This is our offering time, and in just a moment, we will listen to our Leah Carter offer her gift to us, the gift of song. And I invite you, as you listen to her sing, to think about the gifts that you can offer to this church community. There are so many ways. I think of all who will be gathering on Monday evening on Zoom as our church board leaders for board meeting night. I think of all those who have been helping with our youth programs. Those are gifts of time and talent. And of course, there are the gifts of resources that help us to continue to be the church that we want to be. You can go to the giving page on our church website and look for ways to make your gift this morning. 
Let's listen to Leah. As we come now into our time of prayer, a couple things to share with you. First, the beautiful flowers that we have on our altar for our worship today are in loving memory of Michael Fitzpatrick, loving husband, father, Poppy, and forever in our hearts from the Fitzpatrick family. And a couple joys to share. We've had uh, baptisms this past week. Last Sunday, we enjoyed the baptism of Henry Thomas Hodges, Ashley Carruthers Hodges and Jay's son. That's Marsha and Bill's grandson. What a joy. And just yesterday, we celebrated the baptism of Cullen Finneran, daughter of Carter and Jimmy. That's granddaughter of Libby and David Hibbs. Such joy to see these lives and to celebrate God's presence. And now, as we share in our prayers, whenever you hear me say, God of hope, I ask you to respond, hear our prayer. Let's pray. God of blessing, we begin with thanks. For every moment when we glimpse your nearness. For new lives among us, we think of little Kinsey and Theo Wall. For baptisms, for Cullen, for Henry. God of hope. Hear our prayer. God of healing, love, we pray for all those with COVID, those in leadership and those in every station of life around our country, families devastated by the illness and all those who are grieving worldwide. God of hope. Hear our prayer. God of mercy, we pray for those suffering in our country this morning, remembering especially for those in the Gulf states affected by the hurricanes, for all who have lost homes to the fires out west, for all those who are struggling today, God of hope. Hear our prayer. And we pray for ourselves that we may be the people you call us to be, that we may live as you command us to live. May we be people of hope and kindness and light, God of hope. Hear our prayer. We join our voices together now in praying the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For our closing hymn, our soloists lead us in the beautiful old hymn of faith, It is well with my soul. Now go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold fast to what is good, return to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of this Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.